Good morning. Today's scripture reading is found in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. This is talking about the armor of God and how we should put it on for our, I guess, our our struggle and our protection against the evil forces around us in this world and in the heavenly places. So that's Ephesians 6, verses uh, 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the, the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you, after you have done everything, to stand. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you here as always. Uh, and it's also great to be at this time of the year with you. You know, June's here. Kind of feels like summer is upon us. And I don't know, that gets me excited. I'm not sure about you. We, we get to go outside more. Uh, we get to enjoy the warm weather. And usually, as in my case, uh, it usually comes along with uh, more projects, more work, more things to do. But that's okay. I like doing it. Uh, but right now, it's, it's as you guys know, we have this sort of narrow window in this part of the world where we live where we get a small slice of time to be outside when it's comfortable to work. And so we take advantage of that and doing things. Um, I was busy yesterday with some, some friends helping me in, with some projects outside our place. We're doing some painting right now. Maybe you guys are up to some of the same stuff. You know, I, I love the idea of the idea of getting work done. Um, it always feels like a great thing to do in your mind, but sometimes it's hard to translate that into actually getting it done. You know what I mean? You know, as humans, I think we have a, a sort of tendency to avoid hard things. Sometimes it's more comfortable to just sort of put it off, right? You probably know what I'm talking about. We all have those things in life where we know we need to get it done, but sometimes we just kind of put them off. Well, I think our topic today and really for this whole month might be something like that. We're going to be talking about uh, the reality of the spiritual battle that you and I are engaged in. It's an uncomfortable topic in some ways and one that we you know, maybe would probably rather avoid uh, talking about, thinking about, but yet it's a critical thing for us to understand because the Bible tells us that each and every human being is involved in a battle, a spiritual battle of sorts, and the battleground is happening on your heart and in your mind. So in the month of June, we're going to be exploring this topic, like in depth. We want to grow spiritually, right? That's our, that's our goal this year. And if we want to do that, we need to be equipped for the spiritual battle that we're all a part of. So this, this, month, uh, this month we're going to be talking about that, and this morning is sort of a bit of a foundation for the month ahead. Uh, in any battle, we need to know our enemy. We need to know who we're up against. And so this morning, I want to break down our time in that area into three parts. The first is talking about who, uh, who it is. You know, who is our enemy anyway? What's he like? And secondly, we're going to look at how he shows up. How does he operate in his attacks against you and me? And finally, we're going to look at what we can do about it. How, how do we stand our ground? Stand our ground against this enemy. So verse 12 is a good place to start from what Eric just read us there. Verse 12 gives us a really good starting point for understanding our enemy. Is our enemy a person or, or the people who oppose us? I mean, surprisingly, maybe the answer is no, right? And this is a big deal for us to understand. The people that we face can certainly be influenced by our enemy, but the true enemy, according to verse 12, is not people. It says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The real enemy is the one who is behind the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, 
The real enemy is the, uh, the real enemy are the spiritual forces of evil, it says. How does that sit with you? Is it kind of like that project that you've been putting off, kind of uncomfortable? You know it's there, but you don't really want to face it. You know, it's much easier in my experience to, to think of people as our enemies. You know, we can see them, we can touch them, we can understand them. Well, sometimes at least. Um, but when we talk about rulers and authorities and powers of a dark world, when we talk about spiritual forces of evil, ah, it's more difficult to wrap our head around stuff like that. And with that said, you know, I don't think we necessarily need to be uh, consumed by all the details of our enemy. Too often, I, I've seen this, I've seen people get obsessed with the darkness, right? Uh, to the point where it seems like they're more interested in exploring Satan and demons and, and things like that than they are about exploring our God. The point of the scriptures is not to help us understand Satan, they, the scriptures exist to point us to God through Jesus Christ. Amen? It's a salvation story. It's a, it's a rescue story. It's a story about our God and what he's been doing. Yes, there are some helpful things that we get to learn about our enemy along the way. And hopefully we're going to see some of that today. But we learn about our enemy for the purpose of growing in Christ. And so with that disclaimer out of the way... Uh, we can go into this because the Bible does help us quite a bit with understanding, you know, who our enemy is. For instance, in 1 John, uh, John writes in chapter 5, 19, he said, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So the Apostle John makes it clear here that those of us who follow Jesus are children of God. We are under his control. But as for the world around us, it falls under a different domain, right? It's under the control of our enemy, the evil one, Satan, the devil, etc., etc. So that doesn't answer everything, but it gives us a starting point, and, and we get some more information when we, we keep exploring this. For instance, in Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So we have further confirmation here that Satan is the ruler of this world. And further to that, Paul says that anyone who's following the ways of the world is actually following the ruler of of this world. That's very interesting because it means that following Satan, you know, it doesn't necessarily looking like gathering in a group to worship Satan. It doesn't look like praying to Satan. It's it's described here simply as following the ways of the world. If we're living for the things of the world, we're serving our enemy. And we have to add to this thing one more truth here from 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, The God of this world, referring to Satan again, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. I think this is the saddest part of all, in my opinion. You know, many people who are living for this world, have it says that they've been blinded. In many cases, they don't even know who they're serving because they don't know the truth. You know, maybe they've heard about Jesus or they've heard about sin, but they haven't really connected the dots in their life to see the light of the gospel, it says here. And with all that in mind, you know, going back to verse 12 where we started, uh, we can understand why the apostle says that people themselves are not our true enemy. There is an enemy and he rules this world and anyone who's living for the ways of the world, things like greed and lust and power and hate, all, all those things, right? People who are living for them and those things are actually living for the enemy, our enemy. You know, the people themselves, that's not our enemy. They might not even realize that they're serving our enemy, but they are serving him nonetheless. Just like in the Garden of Eden, right? Satan has tricked them. He's tricked them into thinking that they can pursue something better than what God has. But it's all a lie. 
This challenges us, I, I think, <laughs> to, to imagine or think on a much bigger scale about who our enemy is. Maybe it's more comfortable to think about that person who's done you wrong as your enemy. But there's a lot more at work than what meets the eye. You know, the physical realm that we see is kind of like a puppet in a puppet show. Our mind is tricked into thinking that the puppet is real, but if we think about it on a deeper level, we know that there are other forces at work, right? Animating those puppets. Now, I know that's not a perfect illustration because the puppets don't have any choice. They don't have any free will, and we do. You know, in our case, we have a choice. We can either follow the influence of the God of this world, or we can follow the influence of our God in heaven. But the reality is most of the time, and, and you know this, right, from living, what's happening is more like a battle between those two influences that's going on in your heart and in your mind. So how's this, uh, how's this sitting with you so far? Does it fit your understanding of our enemy? You know, the Bible says that our enemy is crafty. He's crafty, and he, he dresses up as, as someone that he's not. The Bible says that he is trying to fool us about who he is. There's a great illustration about this that I heard I want to share with you, even though I don't know who originally came up with it. I wish I did, because I would give them credit. But here is a picture of uh, a really cool creature called the Regal Horned Lizard. This thing exists all over North America, apparently. Not in Winnipeg, I haven't seen it. But all over North America, particularly in Arizona. It might look pretty scary in this picture, but the regal horned lizard is actually quite small. And it has a lot of natural predators, including like some big snakes that will eat it. So in order to defend itself, it can use two different types of deception. It has these two tools in its toolbox. The first deception is puffing itself up. It sucks in air, it puffs itself up, and it, it tries to scare away its predators by making them think that it's bigger than it actually is. So that's the first deception. The second deception is quite the opposite. It actually will play dead. It's, it's very convincing, too. Actually, I encourage you to look this up later on YouTube. It's, it's hilarious. But um, it flips over on its back. And it sticks its legs out and its hands out and like it has rigor mortis or something, completely stiff, so it appears dead. And, uh, and, and certain kinds of snakes apparently will not eat things that they haven't killed themselves. And so if it comes up, sees it dead, it goes to somewhere else. And so it helps the regal horned lizard survive. It's very cool. But I want to suggest, uh, back to our topic, I want to suggest to you today that our enemy is deceiving people much like this lizard is. For some of us, he's puffed himself up to look much bigger than he really is. You know, he's a powerful enemy, but he's not all-powerful. We might be used to thinking about God and Satan as, you know, sort of opposing equal enemies, but that's not the case, right? Not even close. Satan is certainly opposed to God, yes, but he's nowhere near his equal. And we need to remember this. For instance, God is all-knowing, all-knowing, but Satan isn't. Much like a human, Satan doesn't know everything, and he doesn't see everything like God does. God is also all-powerful, but Satan isn't. He, God has complete control over everything, but Satan has limited power. And finally, God is all-present. He exists everywhere at all times. He is present with us right here, right now, listening, seeing what's happening. He's hearing our prayers. And He's also present with our brothers and sisters, you know, across the world as they meet and as they pray. It's amazing. God is all-present. But Satan isn't. He's a created being, right? Right? And he and his followers can only be in one place at one time, just like every other created being. We need to remember these things. Because Satan would love to puff himself up like that lizard and make us believe that he's much greater than he really is. But maybe for you, that's not the deception, right? Maybe, maybe it's the other one. Maybe you've been tricked into thinking, like this lizard, that 
Satan is playing dead in your life. You don't really think about him very much. He's not really on your mind. In fact, it seems like he might not even be there. Instead of thinking he's too powerful, you've been tricked into thinking that he's not powerful at all. And, and you know what? Maybe he really doesn't even show up in any practical way in your life. You go through life completely ignoring the fact that he and his followers are at work all around you. He's deceived you into thinking that he's not really active. Both of these deceptions, the puffing up and the playing dead, are dangerous if we believe them. We need to find a balance, and, and I think the balance is what it's in the words of the Apostle John from the second half of verse 4, in chapter 4. In 1 John, he says, The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That's good news. Yes, we have an enemy who is alive and well, and, and yes, his aim is to draw as many people as possible away from God as he can. And you know what? He's pretty good at it. And he is a powerful enemy, but in comparison to our God, he is nothing. He's already been defeated by the cross. And when we partner with God through Jesus, uh, through Jesus we can be victorious as well. So we, we're beginning to get a bit of a framework for who our enemy is. There's a lot more we could say. But now we can move on to talking about how he's working. How does he show up in this world? Well, how does he actually fight against you and me and try to drag us away from God? Again, there's a lot we could say here, but today I want to focus on two of his methods, you could say. I want to focus on trials and temptations. Temptations and trials. We'll start with temptations. You probably remember the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. We don't have time to read the account today, but you can look it up later. It's in Matthew 4. It's in Luke 4. Go check it out there. Um, Jesus goes into the wilderness, if you'll remember, for 40 days, right? He's fasting in the wilderness after his baptism. And during this time, when Jesus is weak from fasting, Satan shows up. In this, we see his craftiness, right? Remember, he's not equal to God. He doesn't have unlimited resources. He's limited. And he wants to use his resources efficiently. And so he shows up in Jesus' life just like he's going to show up in your life and mine when we're at our weakest. And so he employs uh, his strategy of temptation his strategy of temptation against the Son of God. He tempts Jesus, if you'll remember, in three different ways, right? The desires of the flesh, he tempts him with that. He tempts him with a desire for a shortcut. And finally, he tempts him with a desire for comfort and power. You know, he does that today, too. He's still using the same methods. He, he tells Jesus, for instance, to turn the stones into bread, right? Appealing to his human desires, his, his, his needs of the flesh. Jesus wants to eat, Satan knows it, and he uses the opportunity to tempt him. And he's going to do this for you and me too. Make no mistake, he's taking note of your weak points. He knows where your flesh is weak. Do you struggle with greed, materialism, lust, restraining yourself with food and drink? He knows that. And he's going to use it against you. He also tempts Jesus with a shortcut. You know, instead of following God's plan of revealing himself to the people, why not take a shortcut, he proposes. Just jump off this building and allow the angels to save you. This will prove that you're from God. And you won't have to go through all the heartache and the hard work of, of, of being the Messiah. If he jumped and if the angels saved him, it, it might have been easier than following God's plan. But this wasn't God's plan. God wanted Jesus to carry out his ministry slowly over time so that it would be more effective, right? And Jesus was not willing to compromise on this by taking a shortcut. How about you? How about me? Do we ever feel tempted to take a shortcut to compromise on doing what is right so we can get what we want now to take control of the timeline instead of letting God be in control of it 
Satan is going to tempt us in the same way, too. And finally, we learn from the story of of Jesus that Satan tempts Jesus with comfort and power. At the same, uh, sorry, at a time, at a time when Jesus knew the path ahead, right? He he knew where his father was leading him. He knew that this was going to be a difficult ministry. Satan was right there to offer an easier path, a more comfortable path. If he would just compromise just a little bit on what God wanted. This is how Satan worked with Jesus, and he's going to do the same thing in your life and mine as well. He's going to dangle flashy things in front of your face. He's going to tempt you with comfortable things that seem so attractive. Why would you follow the challenging path that God has for you when you could have all this instead, he will say. Do what's best for you, he might whisper. But all of this is part of his mission to draw us away from God. His temptations is one of his main operating, uh, main ways of operating in, in his attack against us. And so we got to cut that off. We want to talk about his, his, uh, another way that he operates in his attacks against us is through trials. Through trials. So besides the temptation, he's working in trials too. And the story of Job's life is just a gem for us in understanding this. We've been talking about trials a lot recently so that so we know that God can use them and he does use them for our good, right? He he uses them to shape us and help us grow. But the story of Job helps us to see that Satan has a different plan, a much different plan for our trials. Instead of using them to help us grow, his desire is to use them to crush our faith and drag us away from God. And and the story of Job uh, it gives us sort of a, a picture of that. Uh, some insight into what's happening in, in those times. And, and um, the story of Job, it starts with this sort of strange scene where Satan is challenging God in regards to Job's faith. He says, he says to God, you know what, the only reason Job loves you and lives a righteous life is because you've, you've blessed him with so many things. I mean, look at his life. If you took all that away, you'd see right away that his faith is fake. Well, the rest of the story of Job proves that Satan was wrong, of course. But in the process, oh, God and his, uh, his sovereignty and, and wisdom allowed Satan to reap havoc, wreak havoc on Job's life. Satan wanted to destroy Job's faith, but God turned it into something better than what Satan had in mind. I imagine if you're thinking about your own life, you could, you could come up with a short list of sort of the worst days of your life. Maybe think about that for a second. You know, for Job, the day that's being depicted in this picture here, it had to be at the top of the list. Chapter 1 in Job says that his livestock, which is a source of income, you could think about it as his job, was stolen, it was burned, his servants were murdered, And there was a violent windstorm that knocked over the house that his children were staying in and killed them all. And then Job himself became ill with painful sores all over his body. And to top it off, his wife and his friends failed to offer any real support. I mean, it was an absolute mess for him. How does that sit with you? (laughs) That's challenging, right? Does it make you uncomfortable to know that God allowed Satan to do all these things? It's not easy. It's not even, maybe not even possible for us to understand the why or or the how or, or any of those things completely. We have to trust that God knows far more than we do and that the decision he made was the best one. And also, more importantly to this to our discussion this morning, we need to remember that God remained in complete control through this whole situation, even though it didn't always look like it. I recently took a jujitsu class. Just one, don't worry. uh, You don't have to be afraid of me yet. Um, Maybe never. Uh, But So it was a very eye-opening experience for me, though, because I learned two of the core principles of jujitsu are leverage and momentum. Not strength. You know, I kind of went in thinking, oh, it's about being strong. But leverage and momentum, it's not so much about strength. You know, someone who's physically weaker can totally defeat a stronger person if they know how to use their opponent's weight and their strength against them. 
That's really a big part of jujitsu, using your opponent's weight and momentum against them. And I think there's a cool parallel in this for how God turns Satan's efforts back on himself. Um, in Ephesians 1.11, it says that in him, in Jesus, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in, a, in conformity with the purpose of his will. It says here that God works out everything to align with his will. And I want us to just notice that today. Everything means everything, right? Even the deceitful scheming and the attacks of our enemy. And if we see, well, if we're willing to look for it, we're going to find it. I mean, we see this all through the Bible, right? Think about the history of the Israelites, for instance. There are stories, and I know you know them, of, of times when a nation will come against Israel. They're plotting to do evil. They're plotting to destroy God's people. But God somehow turns the events uh, to use the enemy's strength against them and, and better things for Israel. You know, you could say that he's using their strength against them, just like in jiu-jitsu. And we see this story all through, all through the Bible. For instance, Jay shared with us last week about the story of Joseph, right? He was attacked by his brothers. After all their attacks, Joseph speaks to his brothers and he says, in Genesis 50 verse 20, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So Satan was at work in the hearts of the brothers intending to harm Joseph, right? But God turned Satan's efforts against him and brought good from it. This principle shows up all through the scriptures. And if we're willing to accept it, it can bring a whole new level of meaning to the words, God is in control. Just like it says in Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is able to work out some things, right? No, everything, all things for the good of his people. This is the reason why we don't have to be afraid of Satan's attacks. Because God knows us, and he knows our situation so well. And he's in control. And, and even if he were to allow Satan to bring some kind of difficulty into our life like he did with Job, he would still be in complete control and working to bring good from the situation. We can trust him with that. He would use Satan's efforts against him for our benefit and his. Well, we can trust our God with this. We don't have to be afraid of our enemy, uh, even if he shows up in the difficult circumstances in our life. We know that our God is greater. So two of the main ways that, that he operates, our enemy operates, is through trials and temptations. And now I just want to end off with some brief thoughts on what we can do about it. Now, for today, this is just going to be like really broad strokes, okay? Because, like we said earlier, uh, the rest of this month is going to be about digging into Ephesians 6 and, and looking at what the Bible calls the armor of God. The armor of God. Brothers and sisters, we are in a battle. I hope you know that. We are in a battle. And even if you've never fought in combat, you, you understand well enough at least to know that you would never go into any kind of combat wearing absolutely no armor. You need to protect yourself, right? But the scary thing is that many of us might be engaging in battle right now with our enemy wearing absolutely no armor. How do you think that's going to go for you? God has given us a set of armor to wear. And the rest of this month is going to be about unpacking exactly how we can put that armor on and how that armor helps to protect us against these attacks from our enemy. So as we wrap up today, I just want to leave us with two things that, can, that we can take home and apply today. The first is this. It's not all up to you. And that's good. <laughs> that's good. It's not all up to you. I want to go back to what, uh, the scripture that we already looked at here from 1 John 4.4. 4. The apostle says, The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 
That's good stuff. But do you believe it? Do you believe this down to your core? Brothers and sisters, as we've been saying, we have a real enemy. We have a powerful enemy. But guess what? Our God is greater. In fact, there's not even a comparison to be made. And the one who has overcome our enemy is the one who is living in you through his spirit. Don't forget that, please. We do not need to be afraid. And in some very real ways, Satan is already defeated. And there are implications of this too, to us in the battle. And one of the most obvious, in my mind at least, is that in the midst of the battle, we need to stick with our God. We need to stay with Him. He's our strength. He's our protector. He's our Savior. We need to be close to Him. We need to look for Him in the midst of the battle because sometimes when the fighting gets intense, we might take our eyes off of Him and focus on our enemy instead or or focus on our circumstances or the temptations that are before us. We need to look to Him instead. We need to see Him and stay with Him in the midst of the battle and look for the ways that He's showing up all around us in the people that He brings into your life, in the ways that things are working out around you. Look for Him and be near to Him. And so the last thing I want to leave with us today is an encouragement to engage in the battle, to get in there. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think about the battle in a quite a passive way. I think about it in terms of, you know, minding my own business, keeping my head down and sort of staying out of the way, hoping that Satan won't notice me. Or maybe at the very best, I might think about the battle in terms of putting on the armor of God, you know, kind of quietly sitting off in the corner, making sure the armor's on, making sure I'm ready just in case he comes. But I hope I can challenge us this morning to think bigger than that. I believe that God has more meaningful plans for us than just hiding and preparing. Through Jesus and with God's armor, we we can actually have the confidence to advance against our enemy and take back ground from him, ground that was lost. We can go after him. Brothers and sisters, we all know that Satan has taken ground in our city, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our families, and even in our own lives, right? We get that. It's time to strap on our armor and take back what rightfully belongs to God for His glory. And I'm not talking about a physical fight here. I'm not even talking about a verbal one. I'm not talking about rudely condemning other people over the sin in their lives. I'm talking about doing what Jesus did. Living out a self-sacrificing love for the people around us. I'm talking about investing our lives in the people that are around us. Even people who we might have considered previously to be our enemies. Because we now realize that they're not really our enemies, but someone who our enemy is holding captive. I'm talking about showing them. I'm talking about showing everybody who God is in the way that we live and love. And so that we can do our part to enlarge the territory of Jesus' kingdom, one soul at a time. We need to engage in that kind of battle. I love the story from Luke. Sorry, this is Luke 10, not Ephesians 6. Luke 10, 17 to 19. Uh, where this, is, this happens just after Jesus sends out the 72, if you remember that. He sends them out, 72 of his disciples, to go to a whole bunch of cities and towns that he was planning to go visit and preach the gospel in. He sent the 72 out to prepare the way. And so after they came back from their ministry, their mission trip, this is what they said. Again, this is Luke 10, not Ephesians 6, sorry. Luke 10, 17 to 19. It says there, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to to us in your name. And Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now, there may have been some parts of this that were sort of special to that time and place, but I would say the general principle is so true. 
in all times and all places. I love this scripture. You know, they came back, they were pumped up because they had taken back ground from the enemy. Jesus reminds them that it's, it's because of the power that he's given them that they have to overcome the enemy. And brothers and sisters, it's the same thing for you and me today. Together, we are a spiritual army, right? Yes, sir. We sang that earlier. We're in the Lord's army. And it's the same for you and me today. Jesus has sent us out to advance against the enemy. To turn back souls to him in our homes, in the church, in the community. This is the battle that we're called to fight. But the weapons that we use are not hatred and violence. On the contrary, we see in the scriptures that, like what, it's, what Paul said in Romans, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the message of hope I want to leave with us today. Yes, we do have an enemy. Yes, he uses temptations and trials and other, and other methods to draw us away from God. But if we stick with our God, and if we remember that through him, we have strength not only to defend ourselves, but even to take back ground against our enemy, we will see the victory now and forever. If you're in a situation right now where you feel like the enemy has gained a foothold in your life and you need some help with that, please speak with somebody about that. Talk to another Christian that you know and trust. Or you can always talk to me as well. And, and if you're in, the, in a position right now where you feel defeated because you've not given your life to the one who can, who can give you the victory, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus and overcome the power of our enemy. If you're ready to be baptized to start a new life following Christ, we encourage you to make that step today. Thank you so much for your time.